During Bill Clinton's first seven years in office, the Secret Service made arrangements for 2,500 appearances in more than 800 cities in the United States and abroad, as well as 450 appearances. Welcome to the History Unplugged the podcast, area. the unscripted show that this celebrates unsung heroes, nightmare. myth busts historical lies, anyone and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed the our scenes, world. The I'm your Service host, Research Scott Rank. was tracking a list of several thousand Americans who were considered presidential threats. More than 400 were on the watch list of dangerous individuals. Several hundred weapons were detected each year, almost all of them carried lawfully by people who had state permits. Those who were discovered to be carrying weapons illegally were usually taken to police headquarters and charged with a misdemeanor. There were a number of incidents that the media characterized as threats against the president, but were unconnected to any assassination attempt. But one incident stands out. In the early morning of September 12, 1994, a Cessna 150L airplane crashed onto the south lawn of the White House, killing the pilot, 38-year-old Frank Eugene Quarter, but injuring no one else. The plane came to a halt against the south wall of the White House, causing minimal damage. President Clinton and his family were not home at the time. The Clintons were spending the night across Pennsylvania Avenue at Blair House while White House workers repaired faulty ductwork. There was no evidence Quarter, who had been drinking and smoking crack cocaine at the time he flew the plane, ever intended to kill Clinton or had been angry with his policies. Rather, according to informed associates, he simply wanted to die crashing his plane into the White House. Quarter may have failed in his task of threatening the president, but he certainly received the media attention that he sought. Well, Quarter is just one of thousands of people who threaten the life of the president. And this is true for Clinton. This is true for presidents who came before and after him. So as you can see, the Secret Service has a very difficult mission. It's nearly impossible for it and other law enforcement agencies to predict criminal behavior by previously law-abiding people or to know when criminals or people with mental illnesses might suddenly become violent. Sometimes you have activists with passionate rhetoric. Sometimes you have activists who threaten general violence against the president, but what they're saying still barely falls under First Amendment speech protections. Sometimes you have people who go all beyond that and specifically threaten the life of the president and write into the White House. And then the Secret Service has to wonder, is this a serious threat? Is this a prankster? Is this someone who's off their medication? Or is this someone we should really track? Singling out violent political fanatics is also problematic. Contrary to popular belief, most American assassins and would-be assassins aren't motivated solely or even primarily by deep political convictions. Sirhan Sirhan, Robert F. Kennedy's assassin, was certainly motivated by political fanaticism, but also by a deep desire for fame and notoriety. Several episodes ago on this podcast, I talked with Mel Eiton, who's the author of the book, Hunting the President, and we skim the surface of this topic of the profile of people who go after presidents. Well, what I want to do is do a few episodes focusing on the threats that individual presidents received, how close some presidents came to actually being assassinated, and what kind of people targeted each president. Did Barack Obama, for example, attract a different type of assassin than Bill Clinton, or were all these people cut from the same cloth? Well, the answer to that question can tell us a lot about political violence and fanaticism. And we can also see that many would-be assassins are bumbling and inept and trying to seek fame and notoriety in the fastest way possible, mostly due to the fact that they were failed upstarts in life. And I'd like to thank Mel Lighton for the contributions he gave to the series by letting me use his research. And what he found is that the overwhelming majority of the assassins, would-be assassins, and threateners one after the president, due to personal misfortune, mental health problems, or desire for fame, rather than political motive. According to one researcher hired for a Secret Service study of would-be assassins, it was very, very rare for the primary motive to be political, though there were a number of attackers who appeared to clothe their motives with some political rhetoric. Professor James Clark believes Francisco Duran, President Clinton's attacker, didn't target Clinton because of his policies, 
Rather, Duran wanted to kill the commander-in-chief, a person who just happened to be Bill Clinton. Had he been re-elected in 1992, George Bush might have been that symbol. It was President Clinton's position and prominence, not his policies, that determined Duran's course of action. A 1999 Secret Service study found that American assassins embarked on assassination schemes for a variety of reasons, including to bring attention to a personal or public problem, to avenge a perceived wrong, to end personal pain, to save the country or the world, as they so think, to develop a special relationship with a target, or simply to make money. The report concluded, none of the assassins or would-be assassins were models of emotional well-being. Many of the people studied for the report were experiencing or had experienced serious mental health issues. 44% had a history of depression, 43% a history of delusional ideas, and 21% heard voices. But as co-author of the study Robert Fine said, the way these people sought to address what they saw as their main problem, failure in life, was not inherently crazy. So in this series, we're going to be looking at a number of presidential administrations, starting with Franklin Roosevelt and then moving on up through history to JFK, Ronald Reagan, and Barack Obama. Presidents with different policies, different backgrounds, and we're going to see if they attract similar or different types of would-be assassins, and how close were these presidents to death? Did some of them just barely escape death and we don't know about it? That's what we'll look into. The reason we're starting with FDR is because that's when the Secret Service is established. Now, of course, unsuccessful and unsuccessful presidential assassination attempts happened long before FDR. A new president in the United States is assassinated approximately once every 20 to 40 years. The four presidents who were killed include Abraham Lincoln in 1865, James Garfield in 1881, William McKinley in 1901, and JFK in 1963. Now, as you can see by the numbers, there was a rapid clip from the 1860s and 1900, but for the last nearly 120 years, there's only been one successful assassination. That's partly due to the formation of the U.S. Secret Service, a federal law enforcement agency under the U.S. Department of Homeland Security that conducts criminal investigations and protects the nation's leaders. The Secret Service was established in 1865, but its main job at the time was to suppress counterfeit currency. But in the early 20th century, it realized that it needed to step up to protect the life of the president. William McKinley was assassinated in 1901, and in 1909, President Taft, when he met with Mexican President Porfirio Diaz in El Paso, Texas, the small Secret Service realized that it had insufficient forces to protect the president at the historic summit and they had to call in the Texas Rangers and U.S. troops. So over the decades, the Secret Service grew and grew, and the number of people that it protected also grew. If we jump to 1968, we see that Congress authorized protection of major presidential and vice presidential candidates and nominees, not just the person of the president, following the Robert F. Kennedy assassination. Congress also authorized lifetime protection of the spouses of deceased presidents unless they remarried, and they protected the children of former presidents until age 16. Now, there are over 7,000 employees of the Secret Service, and they have an annual budget of over $2 billion. Part of the reason also we're starting with Roosevelt is that the archives of the Secret Service and accounts of Secret Service agents grow as the numbers of people in the agency grow. So FDR is a good starting point with all of this. Franklin Roosevelt once said, Since you can't control these things, and he was talking about assassination threats, you don't worry about them. Well, that was a great attitude to have because he was the target of many would-be assassins during his four terms, leading a country during the Great Depression and World War II. These threatened to bomb his train, blow up the White House, and simply shoot him. Like many presidents, most of these threats were the rantings of mentally ill individuals, drunks, or attention seekers, but some of the threats were considered extremely dangerous by FDR's protectors. Roosevelt received an average of 40,000 letters a month. 5,000 of those were threatening. According to the chief of the White House Secret Service detail, Michael Riley, the greatest threat to the president came not from the foreign agents or American traders, 
but from people who are just, he called them, plain nuts. Riley singled out Los Angeles as the most dangerous city for the president. As he said, it had more nuts per acre than any other American city. In 1937, President Roosevelt appointed Frank J. Wilson as Secret Service chief. Wilson is sometimes called the father of the modern Secret Service because of the way he improved the president's security after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Wilson's security procedures remained the Secret Service standard until the 1980s. Now, if you're a Secret Service agent, you see the president up close and personal in a way that almost nobody else does in Washington, outside of the president's family. Only in the last decade or two have former agents started writing about their time with presidents, and these are an incredible source of information to see what a president was like in their regular life. Secret Service agents got along differently with different presidents. Some presidents treated them harshly, some simply ignored them and thought of them as wallpaper, but others had a good rapport with them. And FDR was the latter. The agents affectionately called Roosevelt the boss, and he returned their affection. According to Riley, when you did something for him that he felt was either a favor or a task well done, he told you about it. Riley wrote, On the one hand, if you erred, he let you know he was displeased. Quietly, but thoroughly. Riley in his detail believed FDR was a nice guy, but recognized the aristocratic Roosevelt would never be one of the boys, although he frequently made a good try. Riley said that Roosevelt was imbued with a pleasant manner, but he could be ruthless when he desired. Well, the Secret Service detail was often the target of FDR's practical jokes. President Roosevelt drove his own car, a Ford that had been fitted with hand controls because of his disability. During these trips, he frequently played pranks on his agents and would try to lose them on his drives in the country at Hyde Park or Warm Springs. On his return, he would ask his head of detail, Colonel Edmund Starling, Ed, I have lost the Secret Service boys. I can't find them anywhere. Do you know where they are? Even aside from pranks to elude his security detail, FDR was difficult to guard because, as Starling observed, the president was utterly fearless, contemptuous of danger, and full of desire to go places and do things, preferably unorthodox places and unorthodox things, for a president. This was also compounded by FDR's polio. He contracted it in 1921, and his legs were locked in steel braces. When walking, he swung one leg in an arc, moved forward, and swung the other leg. For his first inaugural speech in 1933, he walked 37 paces in this manner to a lectern. In 1936, when he walked to a podium at Philadelphia's Franklin Field to give his acceptance speech to the Democratic Party Convention delegates, he fell in the mud before an audience of 100,000. Secret Service agents quickly surrounded him to shield him from photographers in the crowd. FDR fell at least three times in public during his presidency, but the incidents were kept out of the press. This was tricky for his handlers, because the president's disability meant he couldn't easily escape a fire. In fact, the idea of being trapped by fire was always at the back of FDR's mind. Michael Riley said that the president was completely fearless, except for fire. The Secret Service considered the White House to be the biggest fire trap in America, bar none. If an arsonist or fire struck the White House, the president's agent would carry him downstairs, avoiding the elevators, which had a habit of stalling. Agents always carried canvas fire chutes that could be dropped through a window from the president's bedroom in case the stairs were aflame. Many fringe groups made the president a hate figure, including the fascist cocky shirts of America, the fascist silver shirts, the Ku Klux Klan, and a Ku Klux Klan splinter group, the Black Legion, which was centered in Ohio and Michigan. There was also a group of financiers and industrialists who threatened the president, who in 1934 allegedly plotted a coup d'etat to prevent FDR from establishing what they feared would be a socialist state. Though the media regarded it as a tall tale, retired Marine Corps Major General Smedley Butler testified before a congressional committee that the conspirators had wanted Butler to deliver an ultimatum to FDR create a new cabinet officer, a secretary of general affairs, 
who had run things while the president recuperated from feigned ill health. Roosevelt.